All right, we're going to talk about modeling. Modeling in math is just another word. Modeling and problem solving for word problems. Okay, we're going to take a word problem. We're going to model it with an algebraic um, equation, and then we're going to solve that equation and solve the problem at hand. This will be your favorite section in the whole chapter, I am sure. You just said we weren't going to like it. That, that was sarcastic. Students never like word problems for whatever reason. Because they take hours to do all right, so before we actually do that, let's look. We're going to look at some tables. We'll look at things through tables, okay, like an XY chart. We'll look at things graphically, and then we'll analyze um, algebraically as well. So let's see if you understand first how to read a table. Oh. Let's say I have this table. No. And I want to model the minimum wage per year if my pen doesn't start working. <sighs> Such a jerk. Okay, um, purchasing power. Oh my God. So, how much your money will buy? All right, so the table that I'm giving you is going to show the growth of the minimum hourly wage from 1955 to 2005. It's going to show the um, purchasing power according to the consumer price. I'm just giving you the little background here. And then we'll use it to answer some questions. So we're going to go from 1955 to 2005. It's hot in here, right? Somebody's got some music playing or something that shouldn't be. You don't have time? I wasn't even born then. Yeah, that's still like a lot. What does it mean? She said 2001. 2005. Okay. Y'all some whiners. <laughs> All right, and then I'm going to plug in, and I think I'll pause the video. All right. Take a look at this table. We have the year versus the minimum wage versus the purchasing power. Tell me this, what, in what five year period did the minimum wage increase the most? Um, it increased from <laughs> 1970, 1970 to 1975. Sure. What's that increase? This increase is 25 cent, right? 25 cent. What is that? Oh, no, 45. 1975 to 1980. That's what it's a dollar. 35? Uh, What's this increase? A dollar. No, let's think about it. Look at it again. 50? What's this? Oh, wait. Yeah, from 1975. I'm skipping some, I know. What's this increase? A dollar. That's the biggest one. So from 1975 to 1980, that saw the biggest increase. Biggest increase. Same numbers. What five-year period do you see that you had the greatest purchasing power? Okay, so y'all got it wrote down, don't you? The biggest one is 647. 19, that's right. It's the big, that was a good year, huh? Good year, 1970, 1975. Good. So wait, what is purchasing power? Okay, okay, well you ask them whenever we go down there. Okay, um, so let's apply it. A worker on minimum wage in 1980 was earning nearly twice as much as a worker on minimum wage in 1970, and yet there was great pressure to raise a minimum wage again. Why? All right, so look, in 1970, we're at $1.60, right? Versus 1980, we're at $3.10, so almost twice as much. Why 
might they have been saying we need to make more we need to make more because you can't live on three dollars and ten cents not just that look at the purchasing power that went down that went down so when you think about inflation and things like that and things cost more i mean that's why we make more minimum wage now because everything costs more right okay no this is can you analyze the data in a table all right let's move on remember i told you we were going to look at some tables some graphs jerome's just going to look at his phone uh, read it to us read it to us jerome thank you now with financial ability. loud this guy pick up on the video now Not that the financial ability to buy products and services yeah. the value of a sum of money sentence <laughs> the purchasing power of a million dollars isn't what it used to be from oxford thank you thank you we appreciate that questions about analyzing a table like this this is really pretty all right let's move on then let's do um let's make some app break models let's do some word problems so we're going to follow a little pattern here to kind of try to set up our word problems um in your book it's on page I don't even know um, page 70 if you want to follow it but really all you're doing is um, looking at the information that's given we're going to extrapolate it out and decide what goes with what and then we're going to write a formula to solve okay all right so I'm going to give you a problem and we're going to set it up y'all ready a pizzeria sells a rectangular pizza rectangle rectangular pizza um, that is 18 by 24 inches it's the same price as a large round pizza that is 22 nope 24 inches in diameter what does diameter mean, by the way? Around. Around. The distance is actually the distance in the middle, okay? Across ways through the middle of the pizza. So if I'm looking at a circle, this is the diameter all the way across. What do you call half of the diameter? Good job, the radius. Okay. If both pizzas are of the same thickness, so we don't have to worry about how thick they are, which option gives the most pizza for the money? Hmm. hmm. That's a good one. I'd have to look at it. Okay, right. well, <laughs> you'd have to look at it. Yeah. All right, so let's think about what could we use to tell how much pizza you're getting. We use the number, the area. All right, this one, that somebody said it, the area. Yeah. Right? Area tells us how much space we have. Yes? Does that make sense to you? And how we came up with that, that it's area, because it tells us the amount of area that's in the pizza, right? So if they're the same price, let's see, the one with the most area would be the best for your money, right? Yeah. Okay, as y'all get older, you'll start doing this, because I do things like this in the grocery store all the time, where I'm going price per ounce here, and price per ounce here, and this is a better deal. All right, so what's the area of the rectangular pizza? How do you find area of a rectangle? Length times width, right? 24 times 18. So what's the area of this pizza? Somebody with a calculator. Jerome to the rescue again. 432. Did you just Siri this? Yes. All right, look at my circle. This is a little bit harder. How do you find the area of a circle? That's pi. Yeah. Pi times r. Pi times diameter is the circumference. Pi times radius. You're squared. There you go. I said that. Good job, Cameron. No, you did not. I said pi times R2. I meant to say square. Oh, okay. Good job. I didn't hear you. All right, so my question to you then is what is the radius of the pizza? Uh, 
<laughs> Look at the picture, y'all. All right, is wait, 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 wait. Is the diameter? I mean, is oh, Stacy, I just said it. Is the radius twenty four? No, the diameter is twenty four. What is the radius? Twelve. The radius is always half the diameter. Diameter goes all the way across. Radius is half of that. So I'm looking at pi times 12 squared. So 144 pi, which would be what? 452.3816. What? Did you do 3.14 or did you do pi? Pi. Pi is the better. What do you get when you do pi? 452.39. Which, the reason it's better, Jerome, is if you do 3.14, you're truncating pi. If you put pi in the calculator and actually use the pi button, you're doing all of pi. Okay, look, which is the better deal? Which pizza should you get? Round. The round, why? Because there's more pizza. There's more pizza, right? Yeah. If you're going to pay the same thing, yeah. you want more pizza. <laughs> don't expect to go home tonight. Yeah, right? I don't know. I'm make them like that when I make them homemade. Because it's easier. But yeah. yeah. All right, questions about that? I find the easiest way to do these is just to do them. To learn how to do them is just do them. All right, let's see. How might I, I'm gonna assume that if I give you a table, a list of points, and I show you some graphs with those points, you can match up which one's graph to which. Does anybody need me to do that? No. Okay, then let's talk about solving equations. Did we do that last time? I don't know how to solve equations. We did, but we're going to talk about graphically any equation. And plus, now we're getting into, so we didn't really review polynomials a whole lot. Um, but we're going to get into some of those as well. So keep in mind things we did last chapter, like zero product property. What was the zero product property? No bigs. Right. Is what? But what did we do? When did we use the zero product property? And I'll give you a hint. When you multiply two things together to give you zero. We we used it when we factored, right? And we set each piece equal to zero. So if I had something like x plus two times x minus three equals zero, then I could take both of these to zero. And I could get my answers that way, right? Yeah. What if I had something though that looked like this? How might I solve that? First of all, none of those match. None of those match. You're absolutely right. I'm here to move the six. I'm going to say you're really, really close with that. But you're right. You're going to take out next. But before you do that, you have to do something first. This being the key. That's the key. Okay. Y'all said move the six. I'm going to say if we move the six, my first number will be negative, and I don't ever want that to happen. So you're going to six x three. That's correct. Now, when I do this, Yes, you want to always keep it in order. If you think back, you should have in Algebra 2 worked with some polynomials. Bigger degrees than 2. So I got 6x cubed minus 11x squared minus 10x equals 0. And even though this is not a quadratic to be factored, I am still, guys, I'm seeing a lot of phones out. If y'all will put those away and pay attention, please. Um, if you still run through the process of factoring, it might be something that we can do. Yes, Jerome. I have a question. What? Okay, so you know six x three would be cubed, right? Which is four. It's a quartic, but you just say to the fourth power. I'm gonna say I'm not sure saying quartic. It's a quart this so is a wait, cubic. All right, so look, we're not putting it in the calculator. You're talking about a power of four, you just raise three. it to the fourth power. Uh, three. There's a you raise it to the third power. 
All right, so when we factored, tell me what was my very first step. First thing you always did before you factored. Before you even did that, what did you do? You, you looked for a common factor, a GCF, right? Does this have a GCF? Look closely. X. You are on it today. They all have an X. Y'all even said take an X out a minute ago, and then you forgot when we got here. What do I have left when I take this X out? Minus. Minus. What does it look like I have inside those parentheses now? A factorable quadratic. And even if it's not factorable, I have some ways that I can find the answer if it cannot be factored, right? Name me some of those ways. If you can't fact quadratic formula, there you go. What else? Complete the square. Always works. There's one more that will always work. You can graph it and look. That will always work as long as there's not imaginary solutions. All right, so here's what I want you to see. I have two things being multiplied together to give me zero. Do you agree with that? So one or more of them must equal zero. <coughs> well, the first one's easy, x equals zero, there's one solution. Now the question is, how do I solve this? And I'm going to use one of those ways. That's kind of why I put that bonus yesterday on the test. Solve this two different ways, your choice. Yes, it was factorable, but you had to pick a second way to do it, right? So here, you've told me I could use quadratic formula. Is this one factorable? Yeah, I hear yes, I hear no. Yes. Does anything multiply to negative 60 but add to negative 11? 15 and 4. Negative 15, positive 4. Does everybody see what we're doing? Now we're picking back up with what we were doing before. So 6x squared minus 15x plus 4x minus 10 equals 0. I always start with my negative first because remember if that middle sign is negative, it changes the last sign, and I don't like doing that. that That's why. Fraction. No. Yeah. <laughs> what? You can take two. Out you of can take three x out of both of these. Two uh, x minus five. Take two out of these, you'll have two x oh, minus yeah, five. Thing. Yep. You'll get the same thing no matter which one you put. I would just put the thing that you. Now, your answer is going to be a fraction, but you're not really working with them. You know what I mean? Like, you're not having to do. So now I've got two things that multiply together to give me zero, which means either this one's zero or this one's zero or both. So I'm out of room. The first one would be x equals 2x minus 5 is zero. Add 5 and divide by 2. Sorry, I'm out of room here. So that's this one. Sorry about all the arrows, y'all. And the other one, you would, you're would you absolutely right. You would subtract 2. Again, the only new thing here is the fact that my degree, which is my biggest exponent, is bigger than 2. Speaking of... You should have learned also in Algebra 2, it's called the Fundamental Theorem of Algebra. That biggest exponent tells me how many solutions I should get when I solve it. Okay? So because this biggest exponent was 3, I got 1, 2, 3 answers. Okay, so kind of a double check. Make sure you got it right, yeah? Mm -hmm. um, what, what if I looked at this graphically? How could I have solved it? Put it in your calculator. And? Write on the points. Okay, so when you put it in your calculator, it's going to do, uh, it's a cubic, it's going to do something like that. What's that going to tell you? You got three uh, x values. X values where? You're, all, you're, you're right. Just, two, I, but what, what do you mean five, three x values? It crosses that. It, that's what I wanted you to say. It's crossing the x-axis one, two, three times. Those are your three solutions. Yeah, that thing is okay. close. Like x-intercepts, zeros. Yeah. Well, 
cubic. That's a cubic. What's the name of it? All right, let's do another. One more, and then we're going to jump into some more word problems. Why, let me, let me ask you this and see if you understand. Why does a quadratic have two solutions? Because Why does what? X equals zero? Because X is being multiplied. It's one of those pieces being multiplied. When you multiply. I took an X away from everybody. It was the GCF there. Look at this one. This is an easy one. But see, the difference in now is I'm not telling you what method to use to solve. I'm not saying... Okay, here's a section, solve these by graphing. And here's a section, solve these by factoring. And here's a section. You're going to have to decide what you need to do when you need to do it. So the only thing I'm going to tell you here is solve the equation. What should I do? Because what's your first step? What are we always doing? That's right. Zero is your key. And when you make it zero, make sure that first term stays positive for you. All right, so that means I'm moving the right to the left. Do we agree? Mm -hmm. All right, so add 4x and subtract 10. That's exactly right. Keep them in order. So how might you solve this equation? It's a quadratic. I'm good with quadratics, right? Or we're good with quadratics. Does it factor? It doesn't factor. What number you know multiplies the 10 huh? four. Yes, you changed the sign. Yeah. Yo, what? Stop talking. Mm, does anything multiply to negative 10 add to positive 4? No. It is not factorable, so I have several options. Give me one option. Quadratic formula, give me another option. Graph it, give me another one. Complete the square. Okay? You want to complete the square? Complete the square. Look at it. It doesn't have a leading coefficient. This is an easy complete the square, and the reason it's an easy complete the square is there's no yep. There's no leading coefficient, and my middle number is even. It's going to make it an easy complete the square problem. Okay, so you need to kind of analyze to see what's going to be my easiest. Obviously, factoring is the easiest if it's factorable. Okay, but if it's not, quadratic formula gets sticky and long, and it's not that you can't do it, but if it lends itself to complete the square, well, complete the square. I want to move this. Just remember your rules. Like, I can't complete the square when I have a leading coefficient, right? What is, what's my value that goes in the blank that will make that a complete square? Four. B over two squared. So four divided by two squared. What does the left side become? Uh, X, X plus, plus two squared. equals. Now it's easy, right? Square root both sides. 14 can, is not a perfect square, and it's not going to be. If it wasn't factorable, you're not going to get a perfect answer is here. It, okay? it is. So now it's plus or minus. Square root of 14. So x would be negative 2. Plus Absolutely. Y'all are on this. I'm proud of you. That's the answer. That's the answer. Wait, I'm going to do my complete square. How do you do it? I don't know why. Are you still adding the like, same thing like on both sides? So did you do, when you got to this point, you said, okay, I know that half of 4 is 2. So x plus 2 squared equals 10 plus 4. I did, um, I filled in the Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I factored Oh, you just factored it out instead of applying the pattern. That's fine. That's fine. All right, questions. What time do we get done in here? No, 
All right, I'm going to stop here because I'm not going to do the graphing part just yet.